gales in all areas except Trafalgar. The general synopsis at midday. Low Bailey, 926, expected 50 miles north of Faroes, 935, by midday tomorrow. Humber, Thames, Dover, White, Portland, Plymouth, North Biscay. Southwesterly 7 to severe gale 9, decreasing 6 or 7. Rain, then showers, moderate... The wind dies down, the storm passes, and once more the breakwater has protected Plymouth Sound against the southerly gales which threaten shipping with loss and destruction. But it wasn't always so. In 1690, the Admiralty decided to make Plymouth its major base in the southwest, and from then on the volume of shipping increased dramatically, and sadly, so did the shipwrecks. Unprotected from those southerly gales, ship after ship was driven across the sound to be wrecked upon the rocky shore. The loss of life was appalling, and hardly a winter's month went by without the sound being littered with the shattered timbers of yet another shipwreck. In 1804, on one day alone, ten ships were wrecked here in the Catwater, and the regularity of such occurrences began to arouse public feeling. Lord Howe, the Admiral of the Fleet, said that if nothing was done to protect the anchorage, Plymouth would become the graveyard of the Royal Navy. By 1806, the war against France was placing Britain in a desperate position. The Battle of Austerlitz had confirmed Napoleon's power in Europe, and only the Royal Navy's wooden walls stood between the French and utter defeat. England's main asset in the fight was her Channel Fleet, but without a suitable harbour it was doomed to destruction and England to possible invasion. The stakes could not have been higher. Only a breakwater could turn Plymouth Sound into a harbour safe from the prevailing southerly gales. The scale of the enterprise was staggering and the cost estimates of one and a half million pounds was, for those days, colossal. But the French were knocking on the door, and even if the newspapers of the day were dreaming up ever more fanciful invasion theories, the threat was real enough. After years of dithering, the politicians finally commissioned the building of the breakwater, funded from the naval estimates. So big was this project for its time that it became universally known as the Great National Undertaking. The man the Admiralty chose to design this most important work was John Rennie, a remarkable man by any standards. Born of humble origins in Scotland, he rose to become one of the greatest civil engineers of the age. England was peppered with his achievements, and some, like the Southwark Bridge in London, still survive. But Rennie, for all his gifts, was not a marine surveyor, nor did he know much about hydrography. He needed someone who could complement his knowledge, oversee the actual building of the breakwater and keep control of the costs. He straight away thought of his old friend Joseph Whidbey, who at the time was master attendant at the Woolwich Dockyard. Before construction could begin, several options had to be considered, although in truth Rennie and Whidbey had already decided how they would proceed. One option was for a 1,040-yard pier from Pen Lee to partly enclose Corsand Bay. This, however, would not give enough protection from southeasterly gales and would anyway probably silt up the bay. Another popular scheme was to build a breakwater from Staddon Point to Panther Rock, about 2,500 yards long. This was eventually rejected on the grounds that the build-up of silt would again adversely affect the eastern side of the sound. There was even a suggestion for building a causeway link between Mount Edgecombe and Drake's Island and pushing a cut through Devil's Point into the Hamos. In the event, Rennie, not unnaturally, rejected all of these schemes in favour of his own, which was to build a 1,700-yard freestanding breakwater astride the centre of the sound. In essence, the breakwater was to consist of a middle section of just over a thousand yards with an arm 350 yards long attached to each end at an angle of 120 degrees. 
This would, according to Joseph Whitby, check the wild inrush of waves and at the same time, by restricting the entrances to the sound, increase the scouring effects of the currents and thus prevent silting. Although there was to be another six years of bickering, Parliament finally voted the money through, and in August 1812, a massive foundation stone was laid on Shovel Rock. The building of the breakwater had finally begun. Since the breakwater was to be built along the lines of the Panther, Shovel and St Carlos rocks, a series of buoys were moored over them to mark their positions so that the rock could be accurately dumped. The top of the breakwater was to be 40 feet wide with a base of just over 200 feet and all in all a total of 3 million tonnes of rock was estimated to be needed. Most of the stone was to be in rough hewn blocks weighing between 2 and 10 tonnes. The gaps in between would be filled with rubble and the whole lot allowed to settle and solidify. In order to produce such a large amount of stone, 27 acres of limestone cliffs were bought from the Duke of Bedford at Arreston and a new quarry was opened up on the Plymouth estuary. Now the site is an industrial estate, but in those days the large boulders were hauled down to the water's edge on railway trucks pulled by horses. For the men who worked in the quarry, the task must have seemed endless and the work back-breaking. Some of the original quays are still in use, but most of the old buildings lie derelict and the railway lines have long since disappeared. Once at the quayside, the trucks were lifted bodily onto barges fitted with the same gauge railway lines, and then they proceeded, as directed, to the various buoys that marked the breakwater site and anchored. The next bit was really very clever. Each loaded truck was pulled in its turn up an inclined railway line already fixed to the barge, and then the load was tilted into the sea. Later, as the breakwater rose higher, the barges landed the blocks using a more conventional gantry. The whole operation was speedy and cheap to perform, and Rennie estimated that it would cost less than 10 shillings per tonne to quarry, transport and drop into position. That's only 50 pence in today's money, and even allowing for inflation, you'd be hard pressed to beat that. Smaller boats carried the rubble out to the men on the breakwater who rammed it in between the larger blocks to help consolidate them. By the end of the year, over 50,000 tonnes of rock had been sunk, and by March 1813, the first parts of the breakwater were showing above the water. But the job was not without risk. One night, three boatloads of workers were on their way back to Plymouth when a tremendous gale caught them out. One boat containing 20 men was overwhelmed by fierce seas and despite the gallant efforts of the other boat's crews, the men were all drowned. The wrecked boat was later found smashed to driftwood on the rocks of Mount Batten. By 1815, the top of the breakwater had been raised by another 10 feet. Well over 1,100 yards were now showing above the water and giving some measure of protection to the assembled shipping. Whilst this was an occasion for congratulations, unforeseen problems lay ahead for Rennie and Whitby. In the original design, the seaward side of the slope had been set at one in three. Rennie thought that the base should be wider, giving a gradient of one in five. But Whidbey liked the steeper slope, and so did the Admiralty, because it would be cheaper. A violent storm in 1817 washed away huge amounts of rock and reduced the seaward slope to one in five. Rennie was all for letting the sea have its way, but Whidbey and the Admiralty prevailed, and an enormous amount of work was done to reinstate the original gradient. It was all to be for nothing. This was one of the few serious disagreements that their partnership suffered, which was a shame 
because by October 1821, at the age of 60, Rennie was dead. He was given a hero's funeral and interred with reverence in the crypt of St Paul's Cathedral in London. If he had hung on another three years, he would have seen his ideas vindicated. In 1824, a savage hurricane hit Plymouth. 24 ships were torn from their moorings and driven ashore, and the breakwater was flattened by seas that had risen nine feet above their normal levels. Hundreds of thousands of tons of rock had been flung over the breakwater from the seaward side, and when the storm abated, it was found the original gradient of one in five had been restored. Rennie had been right all along, and Joseph Whitby and the Admiralty bowed to the superior forces of nature. To prevent any further movement, the seaward side of the breakwater was strengthened with granite blocks dovetailed to fit one against the other. They were then cemented and bolted into place, the bolts being held firm by molten lead being poured into the bolt holes. More rubble was then dumped to fill in any gaps, and by 1830 the whole structure had solidified into an immovable mass. By this time, Joseph Whitby, at the age of 75, had retired, partly due to ill health and partly because of a disagreement with Sir John Rennie, the son of his former collaborator. Sir John, who was famous locally for designing Royal William Yard, had taken over his father's mantle as chief engineer on the breakwater, but never really got on with Whitby. In the event, these disagreements were not to matter, for the great undertaking was nearly done. By 1833, Joseph Whitby had left the house near Bubbersand that he had used for so many years as both his home and his headquarters, and had moved to Taunton, where, three years later, he passed peacefully away, aged 78. For him, there was no hero's funeral, just a modest tomb put up by his friends and admirers, who sadly missed him. In 1840, the surface of the breakwater, being the most exposed, was paved over with granite so that it gave almost no resistance to the waves, and by 1841 it was officially completed, having taken nearly 30 years in the making. But it still needed rocks added regularly to keep it solid, and by 1847 nearly 4 million tonnes of rock had been used in its construction. As soon as the breakwater rose above sea level, it afforded a substantial measure of protection for shipping already in the sound, but became a lethal obstruction to any ship trying to get in, especially at night or in fog. As the shipping losses mounted, the outraged merchants demanded a proper lighthouse to be built to replace an unsatisfactory lightship which had been on station at the western end since 1813. Rennie and Whitby both submitted designs, but Trinity House wanted their own, and in the end their two engineers, Burgess and Walker, designed a lighthouse, which was 32 feet in diameter, with a total height to the weather vane of 78 feet and 3 inches. The first stone was laid in February 1841, and the lighthouse, built of fine white granite quarried at Parr in Cornwall, was completed in November 1843. The lighthouse has five floors and is entered by a flight of granite steps. The entrance floor used to be the coal storeroom and it has a well underneath, eight feet deep, which used to contain the rainwater collected from the roof. On the rare occasions that this ran out, fresh water was for some reason brought all the way from Falmouth. The next floor was the oil store containing the fuel for the lamp, and above that, connected by a winding granite staircase, is the living and dining area. This room is 14 feet in diameter and about 8 feet high. It has a dresser and cupboards, a stove to cook on, and a sink with a hand pump to bring the water up from the well. It's not a very big area for the three keepers who manned the lighthouse, but at least they had a separate sleeping area above. Here were the bunks all curved to fit the shape of the room. 
and above the sleeping area is the air room, where air from outdoors was introduced to feed the burners underneath the lantern. Right at the top, some 53 feet above the breakwater, is the lantern room, housing the huge light which is 8 feet tall and rests on cast iron girders. The lantern is made up of 118 mirrors and used to be illuminated by burners which used two gallons of oil every 12 hours. Nowadays these burners have been changed for modern quartz halogen bulbs and the light is switched on and off automatically using electronic sensors. Outside, supported by a bracket, is a large bell which was struck mechanically in foggy weather and regulated by a clockwork mechanism to strike a certain number of times per minute. The bell had something of a well-travelled past. If you look closely, you'll see an inscription written in French and an impression of a beaver. The inscription shows that the bell was made in 1863 by the Whitechapel Bell Foundry in London and was designed to complement a peal of bells at the Notre Dame Cathedral in Montreal, Canada. However, when the bell arrived it was found to be out of tune with the other bells and so it was sent back to London. Eventually the bell found its way onto the breakwater in 1880, no doubt bought at a bargain price and has been sounding the alarm ever since. So what was it like to serve as a keeper on the breakwater light? David Ball did just that. At 22, he was a supernumerary keeper and did a tour on the breakwater in 1953. He well remembers the living conditions. I never remember being cold. Um, damp, as I remember the bottom end of the lighthouse, the entrance was nearly always wet and damp. But uh, the living quarters, uh, the light down, the light, the bedrooms, the sitting room, uh, which was the kitchen as well. That was always warm and dry. Never no problems there with that at all. Exercise was always just a stroll away, but cooking could be a very hit and miss affair, especially with the sort of equipment they had. Well, nothing electric. <laughs> it was all the iron saucepans. Um, iron kettle for boiling water and a large um, frying pan, iron frying pan, which uh, was used more often than not. Uh, stews, generally anything basic. I don't think if I, can, if I remember rightly, none of us were um, the best of cooks. Uh, you cooked every third day, you would cook every third day, but you were responsible for your own pudding. Though you cooked every third day for the three of you, 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 you cooked or you, you made up your own pudding or sweet, whatever you like to call it. We used to stuff up from someone called Blight in, um, in Plymouth. He was a uh, ship's chandler. And we'd stuff up for three months. Uh, though you wouldn't go on for two, you always took three months provisions in case you, you ran over. And then what was left, and if it was sound, the tins were open, or the packets were open, he would reimburse you for when you came ashore. And you paid when you came ashore for what you'd used. And of course you had to take flour, you made your own bread. Uh, you had to take all the yeast and flour and all that sort of thing for making bread. Um, you used to pot the meat, uh, take a piece of meat, beef, and then cube it, cut it into cubes and push it into jam jars, tight, uh, leaving the fat pieces on the top, and then they would simmer very gently in the, in the oven, and they would cook, and all the fat would rise to the top of the jam jars, and that would seal it. And that would last you for you, that would be like a stewed steak um, that you would use during the two months. You'd clean the lens with um, a methylated spread, and polish the lens. That would be on your tour of duty every third day. So it was continuous. Every man that came on, it was continuous. Cleaning the light, all the brass that was shiny. Um, 
generally keeping the, the place clean, the kitchen, the bedrooms, all like normal housework. But in a lighthouse, you'd light it in the evening at and, and sunset, then you uh, turn it off at dawn, and that was it, sunrise. And did you have to use a new mantle every time? Oh no, mantle. The mantle would go on for ages, unless you accidentally bumped it, bumped any part of the machinery, uh, the pedestal, because that would check it would go into dust. <laughs> then you just tie a new mantle on. But I remember the mantles are lovely, like a silk, pinky white silk. Um, you tie them on, you've got to shape them up rough. You could touch them then. You could touch them and take them to a rough shape, and then when you lit it, it would balloon out to its proper shape. Uh, but you don't touch it after that. It would, you know, it would just disintegrate. Go with the dust. <laughs> the keeper's spiritual needs were not neglected. Right from the start, the mission to seamen used to land a chaplain, and later services were held about once a fortnight. Jack Easton used to bring them out in his boat, the Glenda Joy. He also used to do a voluntary weekly run out to the lighthouse to bring newspapers, milk and any extras that the keepers had asked for. In ten years he hardly ever let them down and his efforts were much appreciated. If it was rough, visitors had to be rowed in by dinghy, but this didn't stop them turning up, especially if they could bring their dogs. Mind you, they had to be suitably dressed. Although it had always been the intention to build another lighthouse at the eastern end of the breakwater, when it came to it, the authorities got cold feet at the expense, and so, for economy's sake, it was decided to build a beacon instead. This was to consist of a metal globe six feet in diameter, mounted on a pole so as to be 20 feet above the high water mark. The hole was set on top of a circular pile of granite steps. The beacon, not difficult to construct, was started in 1845 and completed in the same year. The idea of it was that anyone shipwrecked at that end of the breakwater in rough seas wouldn't be able to reach the safety of the lighthouse. So, to save themselves from being swept out to sea, they were supposed to climb the steep granite steps and then shin up the pole to shelter in the metal globe, which was supposed to take about six people. Of course, in those days there wasn't the benefit of all these ladders, and the shipwrecked mariner would have had to hang on to these small brass handholds whilst the sea tried to pluck him off. It's not hard to see why hardly anyone used it. On a day such as this, it would be frightening enough, but at night, in a full-blown storm, you'd have to be really desperate. A good example of this is what happened to the Yvonne, a four-masted barkentine. She went hard aground on the breakwater one night in August 1920. The seas were so rough that they swept right over her masts. Even though they were right next to the beacon, no one tried to use it. Instead, they made makeshift rafts out of their broken lifeboats and threw themselves into the sea. All were eventually rescued by the Plymouth lifeboat, except for the cook whose pitiful cries could be heard fading into the darkness. The beacon marks what can be a difficult entrance to the safety of the sound, but even with today's increased traffic, it's unlikely that anyone would need to use it as a refuge. Helicopters are so much more comfortable. Nowadays, the public are not allowed on the breakwater, but before this restriction, it was a very popular place for sightseeing and general promenading. Boats like these, offering trips at sixpence a time, would land at the small iron pier or on one of the stone moles. Passengers would scramble excitedly onto the breakwater and roam around picking up seashells, taking the sea air, or generally marvelling at the impressive structure. Later, as bathing became more popular, the breakwater, with its easy access, became a favourite place for picnics. So famous did the breakwater become that in the summer of 1833, Princess Alexandria, soon to become Queen Victoria, came to view the spectacle with her mother, the Duchess of Kent. Far from being the grumpy woman of later years, the young princess so charmed and delighted everyone that a commemorative stone was placed on the breakwater to mark her visit.
Ironically, probably Plymouth's most famous visitor, Napoleon, never set foot on the breakwater at all, but viewed it from the deck of HMS Bellerophon, which was carrying him away to exile in St Helena. All along the breakwater, you can still see the remains of the narrow gauge railway line that conveyed the building materials from one end of the breakwater to the other, and the rusting bollards with the stone barges tied up. Chiselled into the capping stones are various bench and gradient marks and date stones showing the completion of the many stages of construction. Dotted along the breakwater are large granite shelters. These were built to protect the workforce in bad weather, shelter the occasional horse and to be used as a store for materials. There were also two small gun emplacements built during the war years, but they were too exposed to be effective and were never used. All along the seaward side of the breakwater are huge blocks of concrete, some weighing over a hundred tons. These have been dropped over the years to stop the sea eroding the base of the structure. However, even these huge blocks can get swept over the top of the breakwater in fierce storms, so nowadays they're all dated so that engineers can see if they've moved position. The huge blocks are made in these moulds which are laid on the seashore at low tide and filled with concrete. When a block is needed to be shipped out to the breakwater, it's slung underneath this special lifting barge and towed out on a spring high tide. The weight of the 100 ton blocks makes the barge ride very low in the water, so the tug pulls it along very slowly to avoid submerging the whole vessel. Once the barge reaches the area where it's to drop the block, it's manoeuvred into position using inflatable boats. This calls for some skill and not a little nerve from boat crews as they push and prod the ungainly barge towards its position. Meanwhile, the main tow rope is still kept attached to the tug in case of accidents. As the barge gets closer, it's lined up on its marker poles, and as it nears the final position, the release gear is made ready, and there she goes. In 1858, the threat of a French invasion was still ever-present. With the launching of the first screw-driven armoured ship, La Guerre, the French could theoretically bombard our defences at will. And because they didn't have to rely on the wind or tide, they could sail right into the dockyard and cause havoc. The populace became so alarmed that the Prime Minister, Lord Palmerston, set up a royal commission to look into the defences of the United Kingdom. Plymouth was deemed to need at least 10 batteries for coastal defence and up to 20 forts alone to protect the dockyard. These forts would stretch in a ring from Staddon Point to Whitsands Bay and the Breakwater Fort was to be built to plug the gap between Picklegum Fort and Bovisand. The foundations for the fort were completed in 1865, but the design was altered a year later when it was realised that only an iron structure could resist modern heavy shell fire. Four thicknesses of five-inch steel plate separated by concrete made up the outer wall, and the iron shields of the gun ports were up to two feet thick. By 1880, the fort was completed and equipped with 14 12 and a half inch RMLs and four 10 inches. The huge guns, like these lying on Drake's Island, weighed up to 38 tons and were brought out to the fort in barges. They were then lifted into position using this huge travelling crane, which remarkably is still in working order and is now used by the commercial diving school to recover its pupils.
The massive shells, weighing well over 800 pounds, were brought up from the magazine by hydraulic lifts, and when the guns were fired inside the iron casemate, the noise must have been deafening. To get a better idea of what it was like for the men who fired these guns, you can visit Crown Hill Fort. This is an original Palmerston fort, and one of the chain which protected the dockyard. The fort was in use right up to 1986, and then the Landmark Trust took it over with the intention of completely restoring it. Every so often, a group of enthusiasts dress up in period uniforms and live fire a smoothbore six-inch gun on a Moncrief mounting. Now, although this isn't an RML, it is from the same family, but not nearly as big as the ones which were on the Breakwater Fort. The Moncrief mounting was unique in that it allowed the gun to be hidden behind innocent-looking battlements. At the last minute, it would pop up and fire at a very surprised enemy. Once the gun was aimed and made ready, it was fired by one of the crew pulling on this lanyard. The recoil from the explosion would normally send the gun back down behind the battlements, but today, for safety reasons, they're not allowed to fire a full charge, so the recoil has to be simulated using blocks and tackles. Back on the breakwater fort, access to the magazine area is down a spiral staircase. The whole area is dank and dark now but once contained all the shell and cartridge hoists. The remains of the huge diesel generators that provided power for the signal station during the war lie rusting. And somewhere in the dark lies the remains of a once bustling operations room. Below those levels are the coal store and old freshwater tanks now all flooded. In the 1890s, the fort was painted in a black and yellow checker pattern, the remains of which can still be seen today. The object of this was to obscure the gun ports and so confuse the enemy. But armaments technology had moved on so rapidly that by the time the forts were all built, they were obsolete and so became known as Palmerston's Follies. By the time of the Great War, the fort had lost all its guns and became the port signal station. In 1936, it was also used as an anti-aircraft training school with the guns mounted on the roof. In the early 60s, it had become so dilapidated that it was closed down and the signal station moved to the long room. Today, although some of the fort is used as a training area for divers, most of it just rots gently away, waiting for somebody with a bit of vision and a lot of money to restore it to its former historical glory. With the breakwater now protecting Plymouth Sound, the port became exceedingly busy and prosperous. The Navy had made Plymouth its biggest dockyard in the southwest, and as the fleet increased, they became very busy building their own warships. This was just as well, because as the century turned, war clouds once again started to gather. As ship traffic increased even more, the breakwater started to become a formidable obstacle to any ship's captain who was careless in his approach, especially at night. In 1913, this hopper barge en route from Cadiz ran up onto the breakwater at high tide and became a total loss. This vessel, however, was not lost due to carelessness, but on account of enemy action. The Abelard was a converted steam trawler built in 1909. In the outbreak of the First World War, she was requisitioned by the Royal Navy and used as a general duties minesweeper. Late on Christmas Eve 1916, she struck a floating mine and quickly sank to the bottom, where she now lies, gently decaying away, providing a home for the masses of small fish which dart in and out of her rusty remains. Mines and the threat of submarines getting into the harbour caused great booms and nets to be laid over Plymouth Sound to protect the anchorages. 
Here you can see the submarine nets between Mount Edgecombe and Drake's Island. Soon, stone and metal dragon's teeth were also laid to narrow the channel, and a sunken barge was used to anchor one end of the net at Drake's Island so that the boom defence vessel could open and shut the net. You'd think that salvage vessels would have more sense than to go aground, but in 1947 the Admiralty lifting vessel Friar went to salvage the remains of a motor launch and nearly became a complete write-off herself. Heavy seas had dislodged her holding anchors and thrown her onto the rocks. The 14 crew got off safely and the vessel was refloated on the next high tide. But she left this part of the wrecked launch behind and a later storm threw it over the other side of the breakwater where it can still be seen today. During the war years, the breakwater light and many of the navigation boy lights were switched off and in 1945 this caused the largest wreck of all, the American landing craft LST-493. One dark night in April, the LST bumped up onto the breakwater which was awash with a spring high tide. All efforts to refloat her were in vain, and she was later dismantled where she lay. But it was not only ships that crashed into the breakwater. Here, smashed to pieces, 40 feet down at the base of the breakwater, lies the remains of a Lancaster bomber. And it's a grim reminder of how close Britain came to losing the war against the U-boats. The Lancaster belonged to 49 Squadron, based at Fiskerton, and was part of a huge bombing raid against the almost impregnable U-boat pens at Lorient. The attack was carried out in two waves, and the damage to the port was so great that it was said that the glow from the fires could be seen 160 miles away. But the pens were so massively constructed that they still stood, and the aircraft casualties were horrific. Our bomber was badly hit, but managed to disengage. Struggling across the dark seas with a wounded crew, the Lancaster started to lose height. As they closed the coast of Devon, the pilot decided to try for a crash landing in the sound. By now, the plane was almost out of control, and as it limped towards the breakwater, it lost even more height, collided with the balloon defences, and crashed into the breakwater, completely disintegrating. The crew were all killed outright, and their bodies were never recovered. These engines are the largest pieces left of the Lancaster, but soon even they will rot away, and the sacrifice of her crew will become just another fading memory. As the years of conflict finally ended, Plymouth recovered from the terrible blitz that had destroyed most of the city, and re-emerged ready for the dawn of a new era. In spite of defence cuts, the Royal Navy has maintained its historic links with Plymouth, and with the expansion of its submarine base and the repositioning of the sea training unit, Plymouth Sound is as busy as ever. Without the breakwater, none of this would have happened. The fleet would have moved elsewhere, and the city of Plymouth, as it is today, would probably not exist. The people of the city owe a great deal to the great undertaking but so does a smaller, less well-known community. And to visit them, you have to go underwater. If you throw over four million tonnes of rock into the ocean and then sprinkle it with a few shipwrecks, what you have besides a breakwater is a man-made reef. Plants and fish are quick to colonise such ideal surroundings, and soon a veritable underwater garden springs into being. Close to the surface, the jumble of rocks make picturesque gullies which are covered with colourful seaweeds and anemones. Pollock hover over the kelp, and further down a dogfish glides silently away. A wrasse poking through the seaweed looking for food startles a large cuttlefish. The change of colour and the tentacle waving are all designed to intimidate any predator while the cuttlefish gathers itself for flight. Thank you. 
Lying on the sand at the bottom of the breakwater are the remains of all those shipwrecks. Because they're all now well broken up, the wave action has scattered their remains over the seabed and they now provide an ideal habitat for the myriad of small fish that have made the shipwrecks their home. So, in the heart of a busy commercial seaport, the breakwater has made it all possible brought peace and prosperity for the citizens of Plymouth and also provides an ideal habitat for its own underwater community. In an age where the environment is at the top of everyone's agenda, this is a marvellous bonus, unforeseen at the time of building. Although neither John Rennie nor Joseph Whitby lived long enough to see their vision of a freestanding breakwater come to completion, it stands today as their lasting testament. Rennie died a famous man, covered in glory, but Joseph Whitby, long thought of as the forgotten man in this great undertaking, had to wait many more years to be fully recognised for his contribution. In 1980, an automatic light was established at Adern Point, which commands the eastern entrance to the Sound, and was named the Whitby Light. Now Joseph Whitby will know that in spirit he can still watch over the great anchorage of Plymouth Sound and that his guiding light will beam out in the darkness to guide all mariners safely home. God bless them both. Mm -hmm.